It's always important to know that there, there's kind of no way around the, the the feeling, the emotion of feeling stung by that, right? So there's not there, there's nothing that I have ever discovered that makes me feel impervious. Or just, oh, you say that I suck? I don't care. You know, nobody, nobody feels that way. If you walk up to Drake and say, I think, I think your hip hop sucks. Who am I? I'm nobody. And he's a billionaire and he's wildly successful. And he's still going to be like, that was hurtful. Like, why would you say that? Like, uh, I don't even know you. So we all feel that, right? The, so the question is never going to be, how do I completely protect myself from it so that I don't feel it? The question is going to be, what do I do with it once it comes? How do I use it or not use it? How do I know whether it has value? What if three people say three different things that they feel are wrong? Who do I listen to? How, what do I do? Okay, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Another podcast guest joining me today. I love his first name because, hey, we got something in common. And this guest is going to help you craft your next amazing book with a wonderful idea, which I can't wait to get in and talk about. And uh, yeah, we're, we got lots of stuff to talk about. This is great. David's with me today. David, welcome to the podcast. So great to see you. How are things with you today? Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Great to see you too. Um, yeah, there's not many Davids out there. I, I no. feel like David is not a name that's getting used uh, for babies as much. So it's nice to meet another David. Uh, things are good. You know, things are, are busy. Uh, if I think we can all relate to that. It just post-pandemic, things seem to be coming at us faster and faster, but all good stuff. Everyone in, in my life, happy, healthy. The, mm -hmm. the writing is going, and I'm kind of excited about uh, launching an endeavor to help other people go after that writing dream. If they have that dream, I'd like to be the person that helps them get there. Perfect guest for my audience. This is going to be a wonderful conversation, and I know people are going to be very interested as we go through the conversation today about what you're offering in the future. And um, I think it's a great idea, by the way. So we'll, no spoilers, but uh, we'll get there for sure. Can you uh, share with everybody? I always like to ask where you're joining us from today to kind of give sure. us some context as well. Yeah, I am outside Los Angeles. Um, I'm in an area called Calabasas. Which, uh, for a long time, if you said Calabasas, um, people said, oh, Kardashians. Um, and now they say, oh, Kardashians, and oh, isn't that where Kobe Bryant's helicopter went down? So, in my mind, it's a lovely area that is famous for two fairly sad things. Mm. <laughs> but yeah. it's very cool. It's a, it's a great area to live. Beautiful. Awesome. Okay, yeah. So, you know, again, yeah. I'm up here in Canada, so I'm living vicariously through you. So, I would love to come in. And crash at your place for a while. That would be gorgeous to be down there. So anytime, awesome. Okay, well, I'll, I have it recorded, so now I can use that in the future. So that's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave, tell me a little bit about your author journey. I'd love to kind of go yeah. back in time and bring people forward mm -hmm. with us. Can you kind yeah. of take us through the process of how you uncovered the passion to become a writer? Mm -hmm. Can you take us back there a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Um, it's funny. I actually just had a post on Facebook that's kind of going a little. Uh, a little wide, um, in that there was a grade school teacher uh, when I was uh, living in Chicago, which is where I was born and raised originally, uh, Mrs. Luxenberg. So shout out to Mrs. Luxenberg, um, who I know will watch this. <clears throat> she was my grade school English teacher. And she saw something in me even before I saw it or detected it in me. And I remember vividly one day after class, she gave me what I thought at the time was just extra homework. And I was, you know, obviously as a little kid, you're like, really, I've got enough to do. She had given me a short story and she just said, read it. I feel like this short story is something you might like. Just take it home, read it. And then when I see you tomorrow, we can, we can talk about it. And I'm like, okay, great. I've got more homework. So I went home and I read it. And it was a very famous short story by a writer named Shirley Jackson called The Lottery. And I read this story, and I don't want to give, even though it's an old story, I don't want to give away <laughs> the, uh, the twist. But it's a beautifully written, closely observed, gorgeous, evocative short story that in the last few pages reveals itself in terms of what is really happening. And it blew every circuit in my little brain that writing could do this, <clears throat> that writing had the ability to do this, to be subversive, to be tricky, 
to be sort of revelatory in a way that would even excite a little kid who's, you know, obviously just a little kid. I'm more interested in running around with my friends and bouncing off walls. So I came back the next day and I said, I, I have not read anything like that. That was amazing. And that began kind of a communication between her and I that culminated towards the end of grade school with her saying, I really feel like I'm going to see your name in print one day. Um, and I think that that planted a seed in me. I thank her in the acknowledgments of every novel I've written. Um, and I credit her with inspiring me early on to view the world through a writer's lens. And so every phase I ever went through, and I went through all the fun phases. I wanted to be Bruce Lee. I wanted to be Eddie Van Halen. I, you know, everything I ever wanted to be that, you know, I, I actually, did martial arts all through my life, still do. Never was able to figure out a guitar, <laughs> sadly. Um, but imagine myself shredding in front of tens of thousands all the time. But the one thing that was the common thread that tied it all together was I wrote about all of that. And I that was how I understood the world. Oftentimes, it felt like the world didn't make a lot of sense to me until I sat down and started to write. And then things made sense and connections got made and meaning became clearer and importance sort of stayed in me in a way that maybe it didn't if I was just simply observing without trying to record it in some way. And that carried me all the way through my teens, my 20s, my life, up until the point that I decided that this thing, this idea of writing, uh, and in my mind, just because of what has always spoken to me, was novels, uh, as opposed to, say, short fiction or memoir or nonfiction or essays. Novels is what spoke to me as the thing I wanted to tackle. But with that came a certain level of trepidation that, that that's a massive thing to do. Like, how do you do that? How do you start with a blank page and go forward to the last page? And then how do you know if it's good? And how do you know how to fix it? And how, how do you know what to do with it once you do, if you get that far? I had all these questions, and those always caused me to hesitate until finally one day, and I'm, I'm happy to kind of go into this more without like babbling on and on. Mm. One day, an idea presented itself um, that I just really couldn't turn away from, and I actually just made the decision, I have to write this. I have to try. Um, but even though that may be sort of the beginning of the journey in terms of sitting down to write, I think the process of coming to grips with the fact that that is what I truly, truly felt like it was what I was supposed to do in life began when I was little. I, I love that your teacher saw that in you because that wasn't the same piece of homework or extra work that was given to the class. That was specifically for you. Yeah. And like, and what I love now, Dave, is when we talk about what you do, and we're going to get into that in the podcast, but you are doing in a similar manner the same thing for other authors, where you see it in them, and now yeah. it's time to draw them out, draw that out of them. So yeah. you're replicating what happened to you as a child today. I I really hope so. Thank you so much for that. I really hope so. And I, you know, the thing that has been the most meaningful to me are those occasions where someone, you know, say they come to a reading. Um, or when I was doing book tour for the first or second novel, they came to one of the events and they come up afterwards and say, that meant something to me to read that book. And it meant something to me to be here, to hear you read it and talk about it. Your book resonated with me on some level. Um, those are the most meaningful interactions I think that any writer could ever hope for. That something they wrote, someone is going to receive it, whether they receive it by reading the book or by coming to a reading, and they're going to carry it with them. I mean, they may not like actively do something. They're not going to become your publicist and you know <laughs> try to help you sell 100,000 copies, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is they're carrying your words forward, and there will be times when they think about those words, and those words will turn and turn in their mind a little bit. That's an amazing thing. And so it would be great for those folks who feel like that might be meaningful to them to be able to help them get there. Okay, so David, I'm going to spin the microphone around on you. Imagine you have a podcast that you're going to do. You can have any of your mm -hmm. authors that have inspired you in your journey. Mm -hmm. You can have them on as a guest. Yep. A, who would they be? Mm -hmm. And B, what would be your yep. first question to them? 
what would you, how would you answer that? Nice. Um, so I can tell you like, that the, this is sort of like saying, what's your favorite album? Yeah, uh, the I list know. changes. The list is endless. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's, uh, I mean, there's always going to be a certain number that are in your top five, no matter what happens, but it, there are so many permutations. So the writers who I would love to speak to, um, Michael Chabon, mm. who has written some gorgeous, gorgeous books, uh, including one of my all time favorites, which is a novel called The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Mm. Um, Andrew Sean Greer who is just a stunningly beautiful writer and wrote another one of my all-time favorite books, which is called The Confessions of Max Tivoli. Um, John Irving, um, whose A Prayer for Owen Meany remains a formative experience for me uh, in terms of reading that book and finding all the layers. And just, you know, if there's a common thread among these writers, you know, Toni Morrison, um, Alice Walker, and Patchett, these writers who have meant uh, so much to me. Um, Stephen King, I would throw in mm-hmm. because what a, what an extraordinary storyteller, and to be able to tell a story that resonates across generations, across years, mm-hmm. across readers of all kinds, it's just an amazing gift. And what I think the common thread is, and this would be my first question for them, is um, what I like to think of as emotional generosity in writing. You know, and that doesn't mean that the language is flowery or purple, <laughs> you know, or mm-hmm. gushing and sort of like saccharine to the point where you got to put the, you know, the book down and brush your teeth because you feel like you just devoured an entire <laughs> Nestle's Crunch Bar. Mm-hmm. But uh, sort of, you're uh, a very spare novel can be very emotionally generous um, because it's not shielding the reader from the emotional experience. It's not. It's not putting on airs of being incredibly hard or incredibly icy. It's the, 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 it does not look away from the experience of the reader of laughing and crying, of mm. riding that ride. And so my first question for all of them would be, when you wrote these novels, were you aware that the reader would have an emotional experience? Is that first and foremost in your eyes? Or is it your emotional experience in writing it that's first and foremost in your eyes? Because I know kind of how I'd answer it, but I'm just super curious about the writers who I hold in high esteem. I just, you know, it's sort of a variation of that question. What do you start with? Do you start with character? Do you start with theme? Do you start with the setting? For me, it's like, what do you start with? Do you start with sort of the emotional high points of your story as they reverberate with you Mm. or with the great, the great them? out there how do how does how do you jump in okay so i'm going to snatch the microphone back from you in your podcast episode with your favorite (laughs) author i have you right now i would love you now to expound on that and answer your own question for what you do how's that yeah um that 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 seems that seems fair this was (laughs) this was my shortest lived career uh i hope i did well as a podcaster it took it lasted 20 (laughs) seconds but thank you um I would say that, so it's a little bit like that question of, you know, how did, how does the idea come to you? Mm-hmm. And I do know writers where when the idea comes to them, what reverberates for them is, ooh, people are going to love this or, oh, people are going to be freaked out by this. And honestly, and I don't mean this to sound, you know, in any way sort of antisocial, but I don't generally think about how people re- will receive it until I'm much, much deeper in the process. Because then you have to start thinking about that in terms of how is my writing communicating to people? And we'll get into that. I'll, I'll introduce you to one of my writing techniques, which is something I call the Grandma Rose Theorem, which mm-hmm. is named after my grandmother, and I'll, I'll explain that. Um, but I, I don't think an, about it until later in terms of how is this communicating with others. But my first reaction is generally based upon the thing that sparks the idea, which is usually something that I see. You know, it could be an image or a phrase in a book. And then there's usually a little fact, a little something, you know, a little historical nugget, since all my novels seem to be historically set. (laughs) I didn't start out to do that. It's just what grabs me. Um, but there's usually sort of an image, some sort of visual. And tied to that is a little kernel, a little nugget of something that's kind of interesting. And it's almost as though those two things collide and begin to set off 
uh, like a chemical reaction. And that reaction is mine. I have no idea, uh, honestly, if anybody else will find it as, like, gee whiz cool as me. Um, but I just ha- kind of have to trust my gut that if it kind of grabbed me and grabbed my imagination and made me think, wow, like, that could be, like, part of a story. Like, imagine, imagine that happening. Um, then I kind of assume, you know, I'm hopeful it might grab others as well. Um, so, so I guess my answer to that question is it does kind of start with my reaction to it, my emotions about it. And then it'll spread outward to others as I build the idea and try to bring the idea into, into fruition. A great question and a great answer. And I love how you've unpack that for us. That's great. So David, from from your background and your experience helping authors, Mm -hmm. where do you see a lot of authors get stuck early on in the process that can become frustrating for people who are new to this? Yeah. So so I have a particular take on this. It's a little bit like my take on writer's block. I think it all kind of flows from the same thing. And this is this is kind of how I explain it to people. Because you can get stuck anywhere in the process. You can get stuck on the last draft. You can get stuck on the first page before you even start. For a lot of writers, especially those who are kind of sitting down and really trying to do it for the first time, it's usually early. And it's usually to do with, how do I get from A to B? You know, I mean, I kind of know what I'm going to write about. I kind of know that in the middle there's going to be this big scene. But I don't really know how to get there. And I don't really know where to go from there. And I don't really know, like, what what's happening around it. And so, and then you freeze because you just, you, you, you want someone to tell you, well, once you get there, go here. And in order to get there, do these four things. So the way that I think about it and the way that I try to explain it is this. So let's say you and I meet right now for the first time. And before we even shake hands, I say, okay, look, I'm going to write an outline of our friendship. Um, This outline is going to take us from now until two years from this precise date. And each day, I'm going to write down what we're doing. I'm going to say, you know, five weeks from now, at 9.45 a.m., we will be meeting for coffee. This is what you will be ordering. This is what you will be wearing. Outside, here's what will be happening. This is what I'll be doing. You are not allowed to deviate from this. All right? And I lay that whole thing out, and I say, that's how we're going to be friends. First of all, you'd run (laughs) because that's weird. But second of all, you'd say there is no way that a friendship can develop when you have already dictated that strictly Mm. what's going to happen in our friendship a year from now. You don't know. You have no idea what could happen. We may not be friends. We may not like each other. Or we may become fast friends and we may decide, oh, let's go do this. Let's go do that. And None of this could apply, but you're requiring me to stick to this. No, thank you. You don't know enough to know that I would even want to do these things. That's the problem. That is always the problem. The problem is before you start writing, even if you think you know kind of the story, before you really start writing, you have to know these people and you have to know where they are, where they are situationally in their lives, where they are geographically where they are age-wise, but you also need to know them as human beings. You've got to spend time with them before you can comfortably write their existence in and out of these scenes that you're envisioning because you don't know what they would do. If you and I are in a bank and suddenly robbers break in, you and I may have very different reactions. And I won't know how you react until I know you. Mm. So, you know, there, there's a game that I play with writers that I, that I call the yellow light. And in the yellow light... I say, your character, whoever they are, is in a car. I I did not say they're driving. I did not say they're a passenger. I did not say they're in there voluntarily. I did not say they're not. All I'm saying is they're in a car. And they're coming up to an intersection, a lit intersection, and the light turns yellow. What do they do? Hmm. And if I just simply ask that, like, on the first day of our writing together, you may say, hmm, um... I say they blow the light. They go straight through. And then we start spending time developing the character, doing some more exercises, getting to know them, talking about the context of the story. And when we spend all that time, at the end of that, I say, let's go back to the yellow light. What do they do? The answer is always different. And it's not because anything's changed. It's because you've gotten to know them. 
it's sort of like my saying, you know, what would your significant other do? Mm-hmm. What would your kid do? What would your mom do? What would your best friend do? You can answer that question like that because you know them. You're intimate with them. You know exactly the kind of personality they have. You know exactly the type of home they're leaving. You know, you may say, oh, they'd blow that yellow light because home isn't very fun for them, so they can't wait to get out. And that's not something I could answer. If you ask me, what would your best friend do? I would say, I don't know, break? Not break? I mean, I wouldn't be able to answer because I don't know them. Mm -hmm. That's the place that writers have to get to. You have to get to a certain intimacy with your story and with the people before you really sit down to write. Because only then can you walk them in and out of situations and feel comfortable knowing how they would deal with it. And when you feel comfortable, you don't get stuck. And so that's that. That's kind of some of the process that I like to take writers through. It seems like you're bringing reality into the story. You have to. Right. You have to. I think that when you, when you hold the story at arm's length and say, well, this is, this is a make-believe story, that there is no – there is no planet called Pandora if we're looking at Avatar, say, that doesn't exist. Um, then, you know, the story is, and they rode a great big dragon creature into the water or whatever. And that's kind of, as a writer, that's your reaction because none of it's real and none of it kind of matters. It's like, so, you know what? And then the dragon creature talks. Yeah, you know what? Let's make them talk. I don't care. When you start treating it as a real place with real characters, with real feelings and real relationships to the place, to each other, and to the conflict that they're dealing with, you begin to think not about like what sh- what else can we what other rules can we apply to this pretend place. You start thinking about what would this character do in this situation based on the fact that he feels very protective of his family. And so you start you have to start relating to it intimately to be able to know how these characters would react. And sometimes the reaction is going to be based upon the way this character has developed. I wanted them to do this by the time we got here that they wouldn't do it. And you, you got to follow it. You got, when your characters start coming to life and telling you what to do, that's a great sign. Your book's coming alive. That's a good sign. Trust it, follow it. It may take you to an even better place than you thought you, you already had. David, what about when you're writing your book and you get to implant something as a, Mm-hmm. A twist or a a nugget that you can't wait for your reader to find. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that is that a joyful moment for you as an author to kind of oh, know yeah. that? Yeah. Oh, I can't wait for you to get to chapter four, page th- page, mm-hmm. page fifty two, because you're gonna. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh! Right? Is, is that yep. is that yeah. satisfying for you as well? It it's it's pretty fun. It's pretty fun. I mean, uh, you know, in my second novel, The Night Language, I did not set out to have something in that story that sort of reverses your expectations and is that sort of nugget that's planted there. But that's how the story developed, and and it is there. And I remember a beta reader who's a very trusted reader and friend of mine, um, I just said, you know, read it. Let me know what you think. Let me know your reaction. Um, And I remember getting a message from them um, basically saying, oh, my God, page so-and-so. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't see that coming. And I got to admit, I'm like, all right, that that did feel good. That yeah. did feel good. Not so much like I got you. It was for me it was more like the story's working. You're involved. Yeah. You're involved. You're in, you're in it. And that's that's all I could ever ask for. Is there an adaptation of your method of approaching writing? Is there a difference if you're going to write a series compared to a standalone novel? What do you think about that? There shouldn't be. Yeah, there shouldn't be. I think the big difference when you're looking at series, um, like, you know, Michael Connolly's series or, you know, mystery series, thriller series, um, I think that even, you know, sort of like, um, Philip Roth's series of characters, and we'll, we'll leave aside for a moment how people feel about Philip Roth in hindsight, but, you know, he had that sort of rabbit character who ran through several novels. Um, and I think the difference is when you're, when you're writing a series, particularly when you're writing a series around a character who's already very well known, very well established, you know, Sherlock Holmes comes to mind, Jack Reacher comes to mind, then you already have goodwill with the readers. So they're, they're already going to be gravitating to you. And you don't have a lot of backstory to do except as is germane to that particular plot. People already know them. 
So you don't need to introduce their tics, their mannerisms, why they, why they are the way they are. That's already very well established, very well grounded. Um, you know, I don't know that anybody needs James Bond's origin story. It's been told. So each successive story can simply take off. We're already, um, in sympathy with the character. We're already involved with the character. We already know what to expect from James Bond. Um, so you don't necessarily need to kind of ground the reader in the reality of the story. We, we enter it that way. I think that's the big difference um, from a series type of writing versus what I do, which is really each story is its own creature and there's no overlap between them. Okay. okay. So I have a um, – I want to drag podcasting into our conversation here for a second. When, sure. when somebody starts a podcast – one of the first things we have to do is find our audience and identify our audience. Who, who are we serving with our mm-hmm. podcast? Yeah. And some right. people spit, some people create a fake avatar, a fake listener, and they give them attributes and say, this is who I'm going to reach. And there's another alternative where you create a podcast that you want as a host because you see a gap and nobody's talking about things the way you do. And I approach a podcast different than somebody else, even in the same topic. So yes. I'm creating a podcast that I want because it feeds me and I'm creating I'm creating something. And if you like my podcast, you're probably going to like me. So if we jump to back to authors now, are we creating a, a book or a, a writing for an audience or in some cases, or are we creating it more for ourselves and the audience will find it because they'll connect with us as the author? Like there's just, this, yeah. I guess, two different yeah. paths there. Any thoughts on that? I think it is. Yeah, I think it is two very different paths. And while I would never want to um, forestall anyone's path, so if if somebody is getting into writing or podcasting um, solely for the audience, they're creating content solely for the audience, um, all all power to you. Enjoy. Um, I could never take that path. Hmm. In my mind, you have to, you have to write for yourself first. You have to write the book that you wish had been written so that you could read it and enjoy it. And the simple reason for that, and I'm sure it's the same with a podcast with all the work, all the labor, all the creativity, all the time, all the dedication that goes into what you do and goes into what I do. Um, man, I hope you, you better enjoy it. You, you better be doing it because it is nourishing a part of you. It is what you are doing is speaking to you because you're going to be spending a lot of time with it. You're going to be, and I don't say this in any way to discourage people. It's just reality. You're going to, you're going to be told no a lot. You're going to be criticized. You're going to be rejected. That is what every writer goes through rejection. Every writer hears this isn't good enough. I don't like it. This isn't for me. This is not working. I don't want to publish this. I don't want to represent this. No, thank you. Not right for my list. You know, you're going to hear that. And it can be challenging. That is part of what I'll be doing with, with writers is kind of introducing them to the notion of criticism and rejection, helping them understand what it is communicating, helping them get through it, you know, uh, being sort of a book life coach, if you will, helping them weather that. Um, and in order to do that, I think you have, even though our emotions are at risk, because we're emotionally attached to the thing we create, right? We take it personally when someone says, you know, Dave, I heard your podcast. Eh, yeah. That hurts. It, yeah. There's no way, there's no way it doesn't. We take it personally. It is reflection on us. It makes us wonder. It rattles in our head. And it makes us wonder, is it any good? Am I any good? And in order to be able to answer those questions in the affirmative, you better be emotionally hooked tight to what you create. It can't just be mercantilistic. It can't just be, I'm writing to sell. First of all, if you're writing to sell, you ain't going to be writing long. I promise you, you Mm. you will not be writing long. Um, You have to write because the notion of not writing doesn't make any sense to you. And the notion of not writing that particular piece, whatever, whether it's a book or a short story or a memoir, flash fiction, poetry, whatever it might be, the notion of not writing that 
is something that you would say to yourself, if I die right now, one of my regrets will be that I did not create that. If, if you can answer those questions, dive in. And then the rejection, the criticism it won't be fun. You know, it's, it's good to have a little community of people like me around you so that you can say, you know, heard from an agent, they passed and everybody gets it. That makes us all feel better, but it won't stop you. Mm-hmm. It won't stop you. If you, if you feel that emotional connection to what you create, you may not like hearing that stuff, but it won't stop you. And as long as you don't stop, I mean, what's that, what's that phrase? It's always too early to quit. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you don't stop, you're going to find a home. Whether for that piece or the next piece, because the, every experience you get is going to make you better and better and better and sharper and more relentless. And in addition to having just, you know, basic storytelling skills, everybody needs that if they're going to tell a story. The key is you got to be relentless. You got to be absolutely relentless. Um, and as long as you have that, and the only way you can be relentless is if you really believe in what you wrote. And the only way to really believe in what you wrote is to, is that your writing matters to you. That story matters to you. I'm not just, you know, writing a gone girl knockoff, which has no emotional connection to me because that's just not the story that occurred to me. Mm -hmm. If I got rejected and rejected, I'd give up on it because I don't really care about it that much. It was more like, Oh, I I hope I make money. Um, so if you have that emotional connection, you weather the, the tribulations that the writing life brings and you're going to get there. David, as you're talking, I want to jump back to an earlier reference you made at the beginning of the podcast about shredding on stage like Eddie Van Halen. I can't imagine anyone <laughs> sitting down with Eddie Van Halen saying, write a hit, write for the audience. He always wrote right? for himself, right? He wrote for himself. There you yeah. go. I mean, if, if you if you sat down with Eddie Van Halen and said, write a hit, and he comes up, he comes back with eruption, you would say, the hell is yeah. this? <laughs> and that is, and that <laughs> That little piece, that wordless piece is legendary. Mm -hmm. And it's legendary because that came out of his heart. Mm -hmm. Doing that 100% mattered to him. I didn't, I never thought we would be bringing Eddie Van Halen into this conversation. So thank you for opening that door. I love it. I love it. It's great. Okay. David, share share a little bit about your, your books that you've written because I want to jump to Mm -hmm. what's coming and what you're offering for authors. But I want to kind of give, let's, let's talk about what you've done as well. Sure. Sure. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. So, so I have completed and there are two novels that have been published my the third one is completed and it's just now making sort of that submission rounds so we'll see uh we'll see about a home for that fingers crossed um the first novel that i that i wrote that was published was called the luminist uh, and it was based very loosely on a period in the life of a, a character who in turn was based upon julia margaret cameron who was one of the first photographers in history um, she, I, I, I encountered a, an exhibition of her work at the Getty in LA, and I was absolutely stunned by the imagery and just by the ability, and then by the fact that these were taken by a woman at a time when doing anything other than being uh, a wife of a, of a British director of the East India Trading Company would be seen as transgressive, mm-hmm. forbidden, mm-hmm. Uh, it would be looked down on, and she was fearless, and she did not care. And so I was absolutely drawn to the intellect and the courage behind the images as much as the images, and the novel came out of that. The second novel, which is called The Night Language, um, is a love story between two young black men set in Victorian England in the court of Queen Victoria, but also in Abyssinia, which is now Ethiopia. And that arose actually from one of the images that Julia Margaret Cameron took. Um, when I was doing research for the first one, I was lucky enough to get into the Getty archives where I saw most, the majority of photos that Julia Margaret Cameron took in life. And one of them gave rise to the second novel. And the second novel, this is the power of revision. I, I had never intended it to be a love story. That didn't occur to me. That developed in maybe the fourth or fifth draft. Um, it arose from a character who didn't exist in the first two drafts made an appearance for a hot second in maybe the third or fourth, and by the fifth draft had emerged as the love of the main character's life. Uh, And so, uh, you know, that's why I say 
trust the twists and turns that your characters take you on, even if you don't expect them. You know, the the good idea is almost always killed in favor of the better idea when mm-hmm. we're writing, and that is precisely what happened with that novel. Um, so it's really the second novel is really a tale of what would you do for the love of your life? How far would you go? Mm-hmm. Especially when you live in a time where that love is forbidden. Yeah. Um, and so, so that was the night language, and now the new one, which uh, is called the Electric Love Song of Fleischl Berger. When you read it, that makes sense. <laughs> um, that one is kind of making the rounds now, and it kicked off. You know, remembering what I said about the idea of seeing something just a little, little interesting sight, and then tying it to a little factoid, and that sets my brain working. That's precisely how this third one came about. I was actually researching uh, on near-death experiences, thinking about something more contemporary. And found a footnote in the article that took me down a deep, 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 deep rabbit hole. Uh, and out came this story of a young man in Germany at the turn of the 20th century whose life is turned absolutely upside down after he has an unexplainable experience. And the remainder of his life is defined by the quest to understand whether this happened and why it happened. Um, and uh, as I say about the book, He's an ordinary man who, in the end, and for the sake of the one he loves, um, has to be more than ordinary. He has to be impossible. Hmm. And so that's that's the new one, and we shall see if it finds a home. Here's hoping. Amazing. So we're going to have links to all of these in the show notes, because we would love people to follow up and come and check them out. That's Please. I love the variety in there, too, David. That's amazing. Oh, so, thank you. Thank okay, you. so now let's switch gears. Mm-hmm. And you have a plan. You have something you're putting in I do. place I do. to help authors. I would love for you to unpack this for us because I know yeah. of authors that would be interested in this. So please, can you kind of share yeah. what's coming up? Yeah, I invite everyone to find me um, on Facebook, either at my name, David Rockland, message me there, or I have a separate page called The Right Formula. Um, I'm also on Instagram in the, in the same appellations, my own name and the right formula, which is at the dot right dot formula on Instagram. Message me there. Come on in. Um, what I'm launching is the right formula, which is a writing craft book that I completed that kind of takes you through my process and just the thoughts that I've had um, about what has helped me get through everything from generating an idea to beginning an outline, to considering point of view and setting and character arcs and plot arcs into revision and dealing with criticism and with rejection. Um, And so as part of that writing craft book, which which will be available soon, so again, hit me up on Facebook or Instagram and I can keep everybody apprised of when that's coming out. Um, I'm also going to be launching both virtual and a physical writer's retreat. The physical retreat will be taking place in Idlewild, which is uh, in California, just outside Palm Springs, at like 6,000 feet elevation, gorgeous mountain town, beautiful views. I'm going to make it restful. I'm going to make it nurturing. I'm going to make it supportive. And the virtual sessions will be taking sort of that material in the right formula, again, dealing with things like how do I generate an idea? Now I have an idea. What do I do with it? How do I expand it? How do I build on it? How do I research it? What are strategies that I can use that will help me move through these phases? And so the virtual sessions will take those in bite-sized pieces on a weekly basis over a period of time, and, and that schedule is coming soon as well. And I, I hope it helps people. That's the goal. Okay. So, David, take me through the front door of the house as we walk into this retreat. Sure. What are you hoping yeah. it feels like? What is it going to what's mm-hmm. give me a sense of what your dream and vision is for this. Sure. So as as an Absolutely. author, I know what I'm walking into here. I've opened the door. Yeah, yeah. I've walked in. Mm-hmm. Now what's going to happen? So what's going to happen is first of all there's going to be delicious food, plenty of tea and coffee and whatever else people might want. If people want a glass of wine, I got you covered. There's going to be cozy places to sit and hang out either outside on a deck overlooking the mountains and a forest or further outside there are actually areas on the property where you can just sit among among the trees you know there's a seating area with a table and there'll be plenty of writing implements and I'll I'll bring whatever you need and so the way the retreat will work is that in the morning have a little food 
hang out a little bit together. Then we'll go through a craft session. It may be on outlining. It may be on generating an idea. Um, then we'll break, and people will just simply have a nice, uninterrupted block of time to write, to think about what they want to be writing, to consult with me on a one-to-one -one basis. There'll be more food, and in the afternoon, we'll come together. We'll talk a little bit about what it was that we were able to generate, read for each other, uh, do something fun, like maybe take a little hike or have a little yoga session or whatever people might like to do. And then, you know, there'll be dinner and I'm going to be arranging with one of the inns for people to be able to stay. My own sense of retreats is that at a certain point, people like to go have their own space at night. They don't necessarily want to be 24 seven with everybody. So there'll be like a block of rooms at a lovely inn. I'll help uh, with transportation. I'll get everybody to and from. Um, and it'll just be usually like two, three day periods of nothing but being able to focus on writing, focus on yourself, get one-to-one -one consultation on your story, and get that sort of peace that none of us really get at home because there's so many demands on all our time. Yeah. So, David, the person that's listening, the author that's listening, who would be perfect for this? Who is the ideal person for this retreat? I think, you know, anybody, no matter what your experience level is, these sessions are geared towards all of us. So if you never put, you know, finger to pad or pen to paper, um, it, or if you have this, you're on your fifth book, um, this is a chance to just generate, work on your ideas in a supportive setting. Uh, you know, in addition to doing all this other stuff, I've hosted and curated a reading series in LA that's been going for about 10 years now. Uh, called Rorschach. If you're ever in town, again, hit me up at the same spot. And if there's a show going that coincides with your visit, would love to have you there. Um, they're really fun. And what I've taken the most joy from over the years is how many people tell me that these, these reading series shows are inclusive, supportive, encouraging, and they build community. And so for all of us, no matter where you are developmentally as a writer, what you need um, and what I offer, both in terms of my one-to-one -one work with people as well as through the reading series, is inclusion and support. Mm -hmm. The things that we don't get, you know, the, the, the things that we don't get enough of, uh, having someone say, hey, don't worry about what you may think or what other people think. I've read your stuff. This is good. Keep going. Or as all of us know, there are times where what you write is very personal and painful and revealing, and <clears throat> we don't always feel safe sharing that, mm -hmm. you know, especially when you go to <clears throat> writing workshops. Um, those, yeah, hopefully you have a good group, or if you had just have a writer's group around you, but sometimes the experience of sharing things leads to a lot of hurt feelings. It leads to writers not feeling safe. You know, we are very tied to our stories. So if you are writing something that is quite tied to your own personal life and the reaction is, this doesn't work, it's not believable. I kind of thought it was stupid. You know, I don't like that person. And you know that this is you that you wrote about. That's brutal. That's hard. And so I, I've taken great pride and joy in creating a space where writers feel heard, appreciated, and safe. To be able to share whatever they're working on, however raw, however hard, knowing that it's going to be received in the right spirit and the, the reaction to it is going to be, let's talk about how it communicated to us and where we go from there. But there's an appreciation of how hard that was, that you sat down, you put that down in a recorded way, and then you gave it out to other people. That's, that takes balls. Mm -hmm. And so I like to make sure writers understand how important it was that they did it and how grateful we are that they did it and we were there to bear witness to it. Excellent, David. Uh, very. That's, that's amazing. Okay, so I want to close off with this and I want to get your opinion. In, I've had this question come up before. I'm really curious for your response. Mm -hmm. how, do, yeah. how does an author respond to negative feedback, maybe maybe they didn't get the five star rating on their book on yeah. whatever website. Yeah. Uh, they've had some comments come back, but 
maybe there's a little hint of truth somehow buried in that mm-hmm. comment. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. They, maybe, the, maybe the reader wants you to get better, or they they have mm-hmm. some. But it stings, David. It really. Sure. Yes. I've put myself out there. I've done my best. I know I'm not perfect. I know my book's not yeah. perfect. But this this really put me back in my seat. And yeah. I don't know if I should continue, if I should learn and grow. How do I respond when somebody gives me feedback that's not what I was anticipating? What do we do? Sure. Yeah. So so it's always important to know that there, there's kind of no way around the 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 feeling the emotion of feeling stung by that right so there's not there, there's nothing that i have ever discovered that makes me feel impervious or just oh you say that i suck i don't care you know nobody nobody feels that way if you walk up to drake and say i think i think your hip hop sucks who am i i'm nobody and he's a billionaire and he's wildly successful and he's still going to be like that was hurtful. Like, why would you say that? Like, I don't even know you. So we all feel that, right? So the question is never going to be, how do I completely protect myself from it so that I don't feel it? The question is going to be, what do I do with it once it comes? How do I use it or not use it? How do I know whether it has value? What if three people say three different things that they feel are wrong? Who do I listen to? What do I do? Right? And so I think I mentioned earlier the Grandma Rose theorem. Yeah. So this was something my grandmother said that had nothing to do with writing. She's no longer with us, but she was just amazing, just a ball of fire, really cool person. And she was, I don't even remember what she was talking about, but over time I began to realize, oh, this is amazing writing advice that she just gave me. And what she said, so pardon the language, but that, that was her. Yeah. What she said was, if somebody calls you a jackass, they're very rude. If two people call you a jackass, you're a jackass. And so I, I thought that was hysterical at the time. Um, and then I kind of realized, you know, that is amazing writing advice because we all have that experience where someone's like, you know, I don't like your character. They're not sympathetic. And then the next reader says, I love that character, but I don't really understand their choices. And the next reader says, I didn't really care about the character one way or the other. You, you need to make them better. Right? So you just think, I don't know what to do. I don't like anything you guys are saying. It does kind of hurt, but it's all meaningless because it's cross purposes. It's contradicting each other. What do I, mm. what do I do with that? And my thing is, it's like, I'm not a computer person, but if I get an error message across my screen and it's, you know, error code, blah, 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 it's just that nonsensical string of words and letters and numbers and symbols, right? To me, it's meaningless and it's frustrating to a data programmer. To an IT specialist, that is critical information, and that is that is information that tells them here is what's wrong. So when you get like criticism, when you get that kind of feedback, what you need to think about is that's data. Mm. And so when, in the example I used, what is the data that we're getting? Leave aside how we feel. We'll, we'll we'll work through that together. We'll talk it through. We'll support each other through it. And once we kind of come to some peace with it, like, okay, that happened and your feelings are to be acknowledged, it's hurtful. Now it's, okay, so what's happening there? What's happening there is you're getting contradictory pieces, but it's all about the same thing, which is that character. So what does that tell us? What that tells us is that character is communicating to the reader in a way that you did not anticipate. And that's normal. That happens. So the question now simply becomes, what did I intend when I was writing that? Where has this story gone now that it's developed and the character is coming to life a little bit? And the way that it's communicating, is that what I want for my story? Hmm. So to me, I just try to take that information and use it as data. You know, And if the data is like, you know, my character is black and gay and the reader is prejudiced, then I reject your data. Your data, it will not dictate anything to me. If, if, if it is, I didn't understand the choice they made, then that data tells me, I wonder if I need to make the reason, the impetus for that choice clearer. Or I wonder if the choice is not believable enough. 
Or I wonder if the choice stands in stark contrast to who this person has become based upon how I've written them so far. And so I begin to strategize, how does this data help me, or does this data just not really lead me in a constructive place at all? And once you kind of think about it as information that you can use, it's amazing sort of how the sting kind of gets taken out. You know, it's like you, you put a little bit of antibacterial on it, and gradually, before you even know it, you're kind of not crying anymore, and you don't really feel it. It's just sort of like a little mark. You know, and you're on to other things. And so that's kind of how I try to coach people with it. Thank you, Grandma Rose. That was great, uh, <laughs> great advice. I, and it can apply across the board. Like, David, I love that. 100%. I can, that can help you in every yeah. situation. Really, it really can. It really can. Also, she was a hysterical human being. Really cool so the, person. The one thing that I, I've heard somebody say back a long time ago to me, and it kind of goes along with Grandma Rose, is if somebody has a problem with you, to some degree, you are part of the problem. And mm -hmm. that could be simply mm -hmm. driving to work in the morning, and you're driving slower than the car behind you, and you're getting them angry. Right. You're there, yeah. you're just doing life, but you're part mm -hmm. of the problem, and they're beeping at you, and get it's out true. of the way. It's true. Right? It could yeah. be that simple, yeah. right? It could be, you know, I mean, I, I've always believed very much in the concept of action and consequence, right? So I, I, I mean, there are certain things that are very clearly right or wrong, you know, Let, let's not murder each other, you know, let's not be, let's not be bigots, let's not be prejudiced, let's not be, you know, anti anyone, let's, let's try to lead in a kind way. Um, but to a certain point, I've always felt, and it's true of writing, you, when you're about to undertake an action, Try to think in a very honest way. What are the consequences of this action, right? So if, if I'm undertaking a decision on behalf of my character to drive drunk, that's what the character is going to do. If I'm thinking about the consequences, I have to think about them honestly. You know, I cannot skip and say, well, you know what? I, I'm just going to kind of presume the character is going to get home fine. No, you got to think about the character could kill someone. The character could kill themselves. The character could maim, could injure, could permanently disable. You know, the character could potentially get home. Now that you have an honest accounting of the consequences, now decide, are those consequences acceptable to you and to your character? If they are, take the action in the story. If they're not, think about why. Hmm. Why is every writer's best friend? The simple question, why, is every writer's best friend as they write their story. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's a perfect spot to end, David. I really, I appreciate you creating this time in your calendar to be on the episode. And I love the fact that you're out there helping authors find their spot. And it's not just for new authors. Like you mentioned, you could have been writing five books already and you've been doing this for a while. Being Having community and for you to create a space, a safe place for community to happen. Yeah. That is amazing, whether online Thank for you. those that can't come to California, but also in person. I love that your heart sh shines through and your desire to help people. That's, that's really appreciate be, that. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. It's amazing. Awesome. So thank you for being part of the podcast, everyone. Please check out all the links in the show notes and follow this gentleman. Check out his, his books, but also follow along because I think you can find some help in your author journey having David right there beside you. So thanks, David. Thank you so much. Jumping here at the very end. I want to thank you for coming. We have listeners around the world, and I got to tell you, as a podcaster, it is so great to hear back from the people who listen to the show. Now, you are still here. The podcast's over. Like we're sweeping up and putting the chairs away. You're still here. So, hi. I would love to talk to you. No, no, I really, really would. I would love to hear your voice. I would love to hear from you through email. You can do all that at livingthenextchapter.com. I say it fast because I love it. Living the Next Chapter. It's the name of the podcast. Dot com. How's that for easy? Right? Right. So come on over there and 
let's have a conversation. You can set up time in my calendar. You can air quote here, book, <laughs> book time in my calendar, book, next chapter. Let's have a conversation. Thanks for being here. See you on the next one. Cheers. Cheers.